Hi, my name is Maximilian Van Ettrick and I'm one of the co-directors of 10 Meter Tower. I really hope you're having a great time at the festival, The Art of Storytelling. What would you do if I would send you up the highest platform of a diving tower, 10 meters above the water? Everything would be recorded and all of the people in the room where you're sitting right now would wait at the bottom, watching you take the decision whether to jump or climb back down. It's a pretty tough dilemma, and uh, I can tell you I did the jump. I'm actually in the film, 10 Meter Tower. And it's, in a way, the best thing I've done in my life, and, but also the worst thing I've done in my life. When me and my co-director, Axel Danielsson, made 10 Meter Tower, our goal was to record precise images of people in a vulnerable state. We wanted to make a portrait of the human in doubt and see if it was possible to catch the moment uh, when somebody goes against his or her fear. All we needed was a situation strong enough not to need a classical story frame. So we went to the local swimming hall in Gothenburg, where we live, and observed this girl standing on top of a diving board. Even though these images are zoomed into a max and they're quite pixelated, you can really tell from her body language that she's facing a pretty tough dilemma. A high dive seemed like our perfect scenario for the study we wanted to do. So for the film, we rented the same swimming hall and found 70 participants through an online advertisement. The only requirement was that they should never have jumped from 10 meters before, but were willing to give it a try. We were also very clear about the fact that we were as interested in the people doing the jump as in the people climbing back down. We cast it very broadly, men and women from different ages and backgrounds. And as you can imagine, at the very beginning of shooting, most of them were quite nervous. We sort of believed that we would get really different reactions from everybody, but the first thing that happened during shooting really threw us off. The very first people we sent up were a brother and a sister. And as soon as they had reached the top of the tower, they jumped straight away. The consequence was that the next five participants that we sent up would act in the exact same way. They reckoned that it was a pretty good strategy that they just had observed and didn't even involve any own thought in the decision making. I think that's a pretty good example of how the human at its core is an imitating species. But a film where 70 people just imitate each other uh, isn't really interesting, so we had to break that pattern and we imposed a new rule. Everybody from now on had to wait at least two minutes on top before taking any decision. And that did the trick. From now on, people were really left to their own devices. Now we could really study how fear became visible on everybody's bodies. The closer they came to the edge, the less confident they appeared. They started breathing heavily, their legs were shaking. They even seemed to shrink in size. When we sent up Noor and Ibrahim, two close friends, they played rock, paper, scissor to decide who would do the jump first. Noor lost, and after a couple of attempts, actually did manage to do the jump, leaving Ibrahim behind. But Ibrahim just couldn't do it, and before climbing back down, he said, My head says go, but my heart says no. I think millions of years of evolution say no. But something inside of us says, yes, you can. I think we all go through this every day in a hundred different ways. Ultimately, about 70% of the people actually did the jump, but you could never tell from appearance who would or wouldn't do it. The so social elements we usually associate with courage, such as uh, physical strength or extroversion, prove to be useless at the betting game. But yes, at least in our non-scientific study, women showed greater bravery than men, definitely. But if that is, jumping equals to being brave. Once the film was finished, it was amazing as a filmmaker to be able to take part of the reactions together with an audience when the film was playing at festivals. Because the reactions were just so intense. It's like the emotions on screen were directly mirrored with the emotions in the cinema. The audience would get really nervous, people would, uh, you know, sweat, 
And finally they cheered and applauded when somebody did the jump. But things really took an unexpected turn when the New York Times earlier this year bought the rights for the film and published it on their website. A couple of weeks later, millions had streamed the film online. It's the most seen documentary on the New York Times website as of today. We were all equally astonished that the film had reached such a global and large audience because we had not speculated about it in the making. I mean, the film is 60 minutes long and people were watching it to the very end on the internet, where, so they say, a good attention span lasts you a couple of seconds. So how is that possible? First of all, I think that in pretty troubling political times, people were appreciating to see something about human vulnerability, images that are looking for what we have in common rather than dividing us. And a couple of weeks after Temito Tower went viral, another video was filling everybody's feeds. It's called Children Interrupt BBC News Interview. Or we could call it How to Try and Keep Your Cool When You're Live on TV and Your Children Are Invading Your Home Office. It's probably one of the most popular videos the BBC has ever produced. And it's by accident against their will. And what I find really interesting with videos like this is even though the title reveals exactly what's going to happen, uh, children interrupt BBC news interview, we still want to watch it because we're so curious to see what it looks like when it's happened. And I think we should follow that curiosity more. A couple of months ago, me and Axel, my co-director, got a call from the Red Bull office in London. Uh, they had seen the film online, Temito Tower, and they loved it, and they were opening for a collaboration. They told us quite modestly that, you know, they make a hundred films a year, which all are about adrenaline. And it involves fast editing, um, hard music, and some sort of conflict escalation. And here we come and make a film which is basically the opposite. It's um, long shots, it's a fixed frame. But there's a lot of adrenaline in it too. They were uh, amazed that it actually worked. And I think that the key lies in the fact that the adrenaline in Tamita Tower is a side effect of the initial interest, which is to study something uh, about humans and to let the images speak for themselves. Also, there is good reasons to believe that the shrinking attention span theory is actually a myth because there's never been such a clear-cut study with such a definite result. Yet, we who produce moving images were afraid it might be true, so we create ever more catchy content to grab the viewer's attention. I think that's a pretty sad irony, because what those images have in format, they definitely lack in content. And grabbing somebody's attention shouldn't really be a merit. I mean, it can be used to whichever ends, and it can have all kinds of consequences, purposeful or not. At the film school in Gothenburg, where me and Axel work, the Valand Film Academy, our professor, uh, Kelly Buman, once got the question if he believed that a film could change the world. And he said yes, but then again, every film changed, changes the world. Because every film influences its audience in one way or another. The French philosopher Bernard Stiegler, uh, who heads a digital study center in Paris, argues that half of our memories consist of mediated events, things we've seen on TV, in the cinema, on the internet. And it's the same memories which we heavily rely upon when we navigate through life and take decisions. A recent American study has showed that couples who consume a lot of romantic comedies uh, will much more easily break up. And it's not only the entertainment industry which has this sort of naive attitude towards moving images, we can find it in all levels of society. Films might even have influenced the decisions of US presidents. According to the White House logbooks, we know that 
Ronald Reagan watched 300 films during his term, Carter 400, and Nixon 528. Ronald Reagan even had to publicly deny allegations that his favorite film, Patton, had influenced his decision to invade Cambodia during the Vietnam War. Patton is about uh, an American general and opens with an epic speech by the general, uh, which he holds in front of a huge American flag. And I want you to remember that no bastard ever won war by dying for his country. He won it by making the other poor dumb bastard die for his country. Ronald Reagan watched Patton twice in the White House in the days leading to his decision. What I'm saying is that eventually reality will imitate fiction. And even if we know the fact, it doesn't make us immune to it because we can't control our unconscious. And even if we are not in the risk zone, then others might be. After the Paris attacks in 2015, the so-called Islamic State published a propaganda film which ended with a scene in which the Eiffel Tower explodes and collapses over the city. And that scene was actually straight out stolen from the Hollywood production G.I. Joe. The film as a whole, the propaganda film as a whole, was later published on news websites all over the world with commercials in the beginning. So the question is that we ask ourselves and everybody in the media field is which images do you believe are overrepresented in society and which ones are missing the moving image has great powers but with great power comes great responsibility thanks for having me and i once again wish you a great festival